My name is Sarah Donovan and I am in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Today is September 18th, 2020, and I'm interviewing Jennifer Jollett uh, from Lansing, Lansing, Michigan here. Um, and we are doing an oral history project called COVID-19, Teacher Poets Writing to Bridge the Distance, which is going to be archived at the Oklahoma University Oral History Research Program. Hello, Jennifer. Thanks for being with us today. So we're here to talk about writing. We're here to talk about the COVID-19 pandemic and about teaching during these times. So let's just begin, maybe tell me a little bit about um, how you became an educator, where you are, who you are. Just let's start there. Okay. Um, I don't know that I've always, I've never not been an educator. I can remember being little and my sister is two years younger than me and my parents had bought us antique school desks and we used to sit in our room and play school and I was always the teacher. Um, my parents are teachers. My mom taught sociology at a college. My dad taught business and math at a college. Um, and I have relatives who are teachers as well. And so I think going into education just was a very natural I'm not even sure it was a choice. It was just a very natural destination for me. And it becomes very much a part of who you are. Um, everything I do, I connect to how I'm going to teach. Like, how can I use that in my teaching? Um, and so I went to Aquinas College in Michigan. Always knew I was going into education and got a job and have been teaching middle school ever since. Wow. Um, can you tell me about the setting where you teach, where you have been teaching all the time? Okay, so um, I've been teaching for um, about 11 or 12 years at St. Gerard School, which is a um, private school in Lansing, Michigan, and it goes from preschool to eighth grade, and I teach in the junior high. Um, we have, it's a pretty large school for a private school. We have around 50 students per grade, and so they're all divided into two classes, and I teach English and literature and a religion class for seventh graders bit about how you trained to become a teacher, what were sort of the influences in the way that you create your curriculum and the way that you teach? Um, okay, so I think the biggest change for me as an educator came when I read Nancy Atwell's book in the middle. Um, and then I believe that was at the same time I took a class with Peninsula Writers at Aquinas College. And then taught that class a summer um, or two after that. And that really allowed me to see writing in a different way and the process of writing that students go through. Um, I've always written and my grandmother was very influential with both books and writing for me. She she died about a year ago and um, she was in her mid nineties and she could still recite poetry and you know, it was great to listen to her and um, it's just always been a part of who I am. Can you tell me a little bit more about your grandmother and like, is there a specific moment that you recall being particularly uh, influential for you? Um, Boy, I don't know. I, I can remember the first book that I was able to read by myself out loud and how proud I was of that. It was Madeline. And mm -hmm. she sat on the front porch with me and I read it out loud to her. Um, I can remember um, learning to recite Barbara Fritchie, um, the poem, because she knew it and she taught it to me. Um, it just was a part of all of our experiences. She had a large piece of property that was in the woods and there was a ravine and then a river behind her house. And um, we would walk through the woods and she would tell stories. And um, we spent a lot of days in the summer at her house. Mm -hmm. And say just a little bit about what it's like living in Lansing, Michigan. Um, is that, you know, a little bit about how that can maybe influences your writing or your upbringing? So Lansing is not my birthplace. I was born on the east side of the state and then Aquinas College is on the west side of the state and we have always been very close to water. Michigan is surrounded by water. And so I grew up in a town along the St. Clair River and 
Lansing is about as far from any of the great bodies of water as it can possibly be. So this is our current location um, and we're yearning to get back towards water. Um, so I'm not so sure that the location itself influences me, but I would say that Michigan does. Um, it's a Midwest state. I grew up in the country. We were surrounded by farms um, and, you know, field grasses and, and woods and all of that kind of thing. So nature has always been very influential to my writing. Mm. Well, let's talk just a little bit about your writing. How do you see yourself as a writer? Or maybe you can talk about a moment where you realize, I'm a writer. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure that I still consider myself to be a writer, but OK, I do write. Um, I, my parents got me this little yellow plastic typewriter for Christmas one year when I was I'm not even sure, maybe seven or eight. And I can remember sitting and typing on that and how absolutely awesome that was. I can remember being in college and writing my grandmother letters. She's the only one that I continued to write letters to. Um, even, you know, everybody switched to email and she wrote beautiful letters. You could tell everything that was going on in her day just from her letters. And so I used to write um, and, you know, you sit in reflective times and you, you just jot something down and I would share that poem with her or whatever. And so um, that's been a part of me. Again, she's been very influential. Um, I think as a teacher, it's really important to be a writer as well, to go through what the students, uh, you're asking of the students, and to be able to speak with an authentic voice to that is very important. And so when I assign something to my students, I do that myself so that I have an understanding of how long um, and the struggle that might happen for students and any of the problems that they might encounter when they're working on their writing. Um, they, I try to get them to write as much as I possibly can every day. Um, I don't write as much as I would like to. There's so many things that happen in my life that kind of conflict with my writing time. And for me, I need like very quiet space without a lot of clutter from other things going on in my head. But the five day verse writing that we're doing, the five day open write that we're doing every month has been really helpful. Um, and the, the April 30 days of writing was tremendously helpful because it was a commitment in the sense that it became a routine, but it was like I knew it was going to be happening. And some days things just kind of naturally happened and other days nothing was happening. And I think that's very much what writing is about. And again, that helps me to see where students are at too. Thank you. Well, we are coming to this oral history because we're thinking about the writing that we did in the spring of 2020. And so what we're talking about a little bit here is how every April is National Poetry Month and we have a writing group that kind of comes together every April to do this 30 day challenge of writing a little bit every day and then now have stretched that into coming back each month to do a five day writing challenge. And what just sort of happened this year was that the monthly National Poetry Month was just coming right after uh, the school started closing in March of 2020. So I wonder if we can go into that space of uh, March 2020 or spring 2020 and talk a little bit about how you learned um, or how teachers in your state learned um, that you might be quarantined or that things were changing as far as what uh, school was going to look like that spring. Okay, so um, private school, St. Gerard, it's a Catholic school and I can remember much sooner than or earlier than March, my students starting to pray when we did our intentions in the morning. We began our religion class every day with um, prayer and intentions. And it was, it's a really nice way to bring um, the kids together for community and family within the school. And so they were worried about it before March. And we all, I think, were just kind of thinking, Oh, that's far away from us and somebody who knows something will take care of that and scientists have got this under control kind of thing and so while prayers were happening i think we still felt it was very distant from us and then the specific week that we went into lockdown uh, we go to mass on wednesdays and i can remember having a conversation with my teaching team and i have an extraordinary teaching team 
and we were trying to determine what that space was going to look like because we were starting to hear of death and numbers and transmission and all kinds of things. And we made the decision to not have kids shake hands at the sign of peace. We talked really quickly to them before we headed over for mass because that's first thing in the morning and, and just said, you know, to a respectful bow or some other kind of acknowledgement. And the kids handled it beautifully. Um, we were concerned about taking communion, like all kinds of things. And so um, we had started to talk to the kids too about taking things home from school. We had known from snow days and going into exams that they sometimes can't get their study material right before an exam because of a snow day or something. So we had become used to giving them this preparation of, you know, take it home about a week before so that you've got it in case you need it. And so I had started saying things like, make sure you don't leave food in your locker. Like, you know, things need to be cleaned out and you need to make sure you get things home. And so the junior high students were in a pretty good space for going into that, but we still didn't realize it was going to be so extensive. We thought it was just going to be this short amount of time and that everyone would be back at school. And, um, and then we got an email that said, you know, the next day we were closed. And I can't remember, I, I feel like that email went home Thursday or Friday and we either stopped going to school on Friday or the following Monday. I'm not exactly sure which. And we pretty much immediately switched to all online teaching. I mean, without a beat, the parents would tell you that like the teachers just, you know, there might've been a day of sort of regrouping. Um, and we were given about a week's time to say, you're just doing um, like uh, building of skills, don't introduce anything new. Um, kids are under a lot of stress right now. Make sure that um, that we're we're mindful of that. And in any event, we um, we switched and and we you know stayed right on beat with the kids. And and we were doing Google Meets and checking in with them. And um, we had already been posting assignments into Google Classroom, so they were somewhat familiar with that process, but not the teaching from that process. And so um, I thought it was a as smooth of a transition as it could be, considering the um, sort of chaotic upheaval that was happening nationwide, and certainly within schools and administration and, you know, trying to figure out what the best course of action was as things kept changing daily. And so where we might not have taken grades, then we were like, okay, we are taking grades, then we won't take grades. You know, there, there was kind of a lot of back and forth with that. Um, and so I think that caused a little bit of confusion, not just within our school, but like nationwide for families as teachers across the nation were looking at doing online teaching again as we started this school year. Um, because I think they were comparing it to what was happening in the spring, which really wasn't the same as what would be happening with more preparation, if that makes sense. Well, in the early days of, of writing, we were like also writing at the time where these things were happening. Uh, was there a poem that sort of captures initial experience of trying to make sense of what was going on that you'd like to share? Okay, I'm going to read. Um, yeah, okay, I'm going to read a poem called "A Crowning in May." I think this helps to identify a little bit who I am, but also <laughs> reflects the sort of confusion that um, everything, every everyone was experiencing at the time. Mm -hmm. A crowning in May. I am a child, one bead of a decade, chosen for my knowledge of memorized prayers and early reading ability of words and their sounds the shapes they make falling easily from my mouth, yet untested before crowds. I stand small, surrounded by long-limbed children, tree trunk torsoed, older by years, seven if we're to count. Light filters through a time lapse of Virgin Mary blue, wings of angel gold slanting across this prayer pilgrimage, snapshots projected on synapse screens, the click, click, click of the spent film roll slapping against the spool, each click a flicker of memory. I hold in place, await my turn, the voices before me exact, assured. I know my Hail Mary, I am full of grace, but the Lord is not with me. The words jumble, blessed art thou, all eyes on me, who art in heaven, a prayer mix, unhallowed be thy name. My crowning crucified and blood red words and mortification nails, the sour vinegar remains on my tongue to this day. When I hear you read this, I hear the beginning of the light and, and, and then sort of shift at the end to that sour and the blood and the imagery kind of really 
contrast there. Can you talk to us a little bit about what it felt like to write this? And um, I guess also in the sense of writing it with other teachers, maybe reading it as well. Um, I think what happened early on in April and with the, the pandemic, um, everything felt very weighty and decisions that people were making had lots of ramifications to other people. And I think there was just a lot of confusion and concern. And when I was writing this, I like all of that would have been influencing me, right? And so I feel like I was taking a moment that should have been um, inspirational as we were heading into spring, you know, during before the pandemic, we we're heading into a time of light. And then all of a sudden, all of that was sort of taken away. And so this poem is reflecting that a little bit in the sense that um, I had been chosen to read something out loud in front of a lot of people and thought, okay, great. And then stood there and when we were practicing it and all of a sudden it all got mixed up in my brain. Right. And even though I had it memorized, I was in front of people and it made it much more uh, substantial. And so um, I think that feeling, some of that imagery that was coming out of there was from this idea of, wow, you know, there's death happening around us and we can't control any of this. Well, you mentioned at the beginning how, or you mentioned how everyone sort of like made that transition really quickly to online with the best, you know, the best intentions of having it work and just making it work, you know, for the students and for the teachers. What, did you have any say in, you know, after, as time went on just a few weeks in, you know, did you shape at all what that was going to look like online or did you get a sense of what maybe wasn't working or if there were any um, losses along the way with instruction or, or connecting with students? So I think to have really meaningful online teaching, it requires a huge amount of work. So I was finding and still am finding that it takes about two to three times as much preparation for a one hour block as it would if you were teaching in person. And so everything needed to be reinvented and looked at in a new way. And while we had posted things like assignments to Google Classroom, we had not really fully taught in Google Classroom. And so um, as the administration was looking at the best course and what was best for our students, I, our team was very much looking at that as well. And we were reading, you know, national educators and how, what their struggles were and what they were finding was working. And um, I can remember Perneal Rip saying something about, as we're approaching this online time, think about the amount that you would normally give and to cut that in half and then cut it in half again, right? So that we're not adding too much to students. And in our circumstance, um, we have, we have families who, you know, okay, so they may have several children in the household and only have one um, Chromebook or laptop or something to use. And so we needed to be really mindful. And I think because we had kids from pre-K, you know, preschool all the way up through eighth grade, we knew what family situations were like. And we were trying to be really mindful of um, not scheduling on top of other teachers for live meets and making sure that we didn't put too much onto uh, into synchronous learning where kids might not be able to do that if they had another child in the family that needed to be online. Um, and so, you know, we were expressing things to our administration and I was, every time I came across an article with a good idea, I was shooting it to, to our principal and, you know, she said she really appreciated it. I, it, you know, my, my thought was we need to have three plans, like one if we're fully online, one if we're half and half and ready to go at a moment's notice, and then one if we're back in school, right? And so um, she said she made like columns and she would just jot, like transfer the, the article into which column it worked for and um, you know I think I, I think we worked well as a team in trying to get things to happen um, obviously administration reports to superintendents and things have to happen within like the whole diocese or whatever but um, I, I think especially early on you know we we really pulled together and did a good job well talk to me a little bit about um, as the weeks went on um, what were you sort of noticing that was happening with your writing during the April writing? What were, um, what did the writing or the regular daily writing do for you or was it difficult or, you know, talk a little bit about that experience? Um, 
so in my in a normal circumstance, even the five days can be challenging because I might be working and I write best in the morning and I I might need some time to do that. And I wouldn't necessarily have that in a school day with everything that's happening. But during our quarantine, everyone found themselves with lots of time and <laughs> space, I think, to sort of explore things that they wouldn't normally be exploring. And having a routine space where people were coming together on a monthly basis became a whole outlet to a world that would not have happened. So it was a connection. It was a bridge of conversation that happened through writing and response to writing. And it was remarkable. I, I mean, the community, the sense of community that happened in that space was beautiful. And I felt more connected to the other writers um, than probably even just in the five day rights because our time just kept sort of building upon itself. And um, it gave a sense with 30 days of writing of, of who people were more. And it, it was an appreciated space for sure. It was a routine. Um, I knew it was expected. Um, I knew that we were going to come together and there would be a little bit of a challenge or a bigger challenge every day. And that people's voices would be so varied and um, inspiring. And, you know, you just, you just connected with people. Um, and it, it was a beautiful thing to happen during that time when we felt so separated and isolated from everyone else in every other way, with the exception of the people that you were you know, living with, um, to have that outreach of people in that community was really powerful, very impactful. Can you give, take me into a particular poem that you wrote during that time that was particularly impactful for you? or and or any memories of reading other poems or connecting with other teachers during that time that that stands out to you one of the prompts um asked us to pull lines it was like a found poem and it asked us to pull lines or words from other people and then bridge it with our own writing and i think this honors the the space that we had together um because it shows that we were inspired by one another during that time and how people's words really spoke to us in a certain way. So this poem is called Poeming and I placed it in brackets specifically because it was happening in this space, right? So it says, there is space between the stanzas, a spilling of words. Often when I yearn to hear myself, I wander between them, draw breath from their souls. I carry their glimmer in my hands. The uh, phrase carry their glimmer. Wow. Talk a little bit about that phrase. So it, it, that's what it feels like to me when I go in and read. While we all start with the same prompt, the writing is so different and people will interpret other people's writing in different ways. And there's all of these sort of inspirational ideas or glimmers of insight that we have into each other's writing that is really amazing and I feel like carrying this glimmer in my hands is a way of honoring what they have done and what they've brought to us. Thank you. Well can you talk about how we're you know the the quarantine definitely went on uh, more than this March for sure and we're all the way through April where we were together and as time passed what did you discover about how schools work or who you are as a teacher um, after doing the online teaching for, um, for an extended period of time? So I know nationally there was a lot of concern about access that students had to the internet and um, just devices to be able to do things online. And we faced that as well. I, our school is diverse um, economically. And so we have families who are, um, you, you know, who will make sacrifices to make sure that their kids can be educated. And we have families who, you know, it probably is like paying a small bill for them, you know, each month or they don't worry about it as much. And so we made the decision to take all of the 
Chromebooks that we had within the building and get those into families' hands right away so that they had them. And I know like as we're going back into school in the fall, my son's high school, that's what they did. They sent surveys home and said, what devices do you need? What Wi-Fi do you need? And then they made sure that all students had them. Um, so we did that right away in the spring. And um, I think that was very helpful. It was still challenging, but it was, it was helpful to students. And we offered a lot of Google Meets just for kids to, you know, like I, I feel like at least once a week with each group, I was, let's just do a fun kind of relationship, connect with each other, tell me your story, show me your dog, you're redoing your house. Like, you know, they just talked about different things. And it was a really good space for all of us to to, to connect in a way that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, I was doing, I did some sh challenges with them and then dropped off gifts to the winners. And um, that actually allowed a lot of insight for me because I think I visited, well, more than half of the houses, um, either to drop off books to them or prizes that they had won or when our eighth graders graduated, little gifts for them. And it was very interesting to see the living space that people are in and the um, broad uh, range of space that we come from, right? It's not like a little neighborhood school and everybody's coming from that little neighborhood. We have kids that are driving as far as 20 or 30 minutes away to get into the building. Um, so, you know, there were, there, were some, there were some challenges with it, but there were a lot of good things that came out of it as well. Well, let's talk then a little bit about how the school year wrapped up. You mentioned some of the students were graduating at that time. So how did your school year end? And maybe were there any, um, you know, aha moments from your, from your school administrators about what's going to be next for them? So I could joke and say the school year never really ended because yep. it felt like the day didn't end and, you know, kids were sending me assignments or writing or emails at like two or three in the morning. I mean, it was just very interesting. They, they shifted like, and I, I actually thought it was a really good thing because we hear how much teenagers don't get enough sleep and all of a sudden, I mean, even the two in my own house were sleeping until 11 o'clock and I was like, what's going on? But then I'm like, oh my gosh, everybody's finally getting this sleep that they need, right? And, and so our whole time switched from like a, a five o'clock wake up in the morning to maybe more like a 6.30 or a seven o'clock or later for the kids type of thing. But then we were all staying up a little bit later as well. And so I had students that, that shifted in that way also. And one of them even told me like, I think I'm just completely a night person. Like I do everything during the night and sleep during the day. I also had students who found that online learning was beneficial to them in the sense that they said that they felt more comfortable not being around people all of the time and you know some of the drama that happens with students and that kind of thing and so they were at peace being in their own space more every one of them practically said it was great to be able to do things on their own time and in their own uh with their own choice right as to when they wanted to do something which was really good as well. Um, but in any event, we did end our school year a little bit early. We stopped assigning work a little bit early. Um, we thought that it was uh, maybe stressful for parents to try to manage their working and their pandemic and their children and their children's schooling and all of that kind of thing. So we did end early, but our graduation for eighth graders did not happen until August. And it, we they, they really wanted to be able to come together and have it in the space that they normally have it in. And with the pandemic, we just couldn't, Michigan shut down. We had a lot of cases very early on, a significant amount of cases very early on. We were in the top five in the country. And now we're, we've dropped down into the middle part of that. And our governor has been phenomenal. She has listened to science and, you know, there were, there's obviously some people who thought she was not making good decisions, but it, has reduced the number of cases and the number of deaths that we've had uh, by a lot. And so I'm very grateful for that. I think a lot of people are very grateful for that. Um, in any event, we had our graduation in August. We had it outside. <laughs> Everybody was socially distanced in chairs and, uh, you know, there were some tech issues and whatever, but we all did come together and that was a really good thing. Well, let's turn to what, um, or what's happening now. Can you describe the current state? Well, you talked a little bit about where Michigan is now um, as far as the cases of COVID. Um, but what's the current state of your schools 
uh, in Michigan, having started the new school year. Now we're in September. So most of the schools and all of the big districts around us went entirely virtual. So um, some of them made that decision early on and surveyed parents and students about what would work best for them and then made plans based on what the um, school population was saying would be best. And so all, I think almost all of them around us did that. We live in Lansing, which is a college town, and the college is influential in the um, interaction, I think, with um, the population of Lansing as far as if we were... If the college had come back onto campus, there would have been a lot of cases that would have impacted the schools and the high schools and the grade schools. And so... Uh, Michigan State University made the decision to not have students on campus and that I think really helped us keep our numbers down because they have very limited kids on campus right now very limited and it's really the kids who need to graduate in the um, in December or um, maybe they're foreign students or who are living on campus or uh, graduate students who have to be on campus for whatever reason but I think there's under 2,000 of them on campus and they are starting to see a slight uptick in cases in the county that the college is in so we, our school, opted to do in-person learning. In fact, the Diocese of Lansing did that. So all of the Catholic schools in our diocese are doing in-person learning five days a week. But we also offered then to parents who would want to keep their children home an online version. So the teachers right now are teaching in-person and also online, which has been a heck of a lot. I mean, teaching in general is like one and a half to two times of a job um, and is hard to keep up with to begin with. And then this has just made it really, really challenging. So our school has already had a couple of COVID cases and um, the junior high went into quarantine for two weeks and then um, they'll be starting back on Monday. And then I, we had another student who um, had COVID in a different grade level um, this week. And so and we're starting to see this happening in the few schools that chose to come back face to face. Um, so I think I think we're going to continue to see this happen. It's going to be a back and forth, and it's hard. It's hard for parents, and it's hard for students, and it's hard for teachers. And there is no great answer to this. Um, I wish there were a great answer to this, but it's not. And I'm hopeful that it's just going to be a temporary thing, and that next school year things will be back to normal as much as they can be. How has this been for you? Um, this has been really challenging. I, I get, I am inspired by my students every day that I'm in the classroom. And it doesn't matter what's going on in the world around me. When I'm in the classroom, it's just a good space. And lots of really good things happen in there. I mean, the kids just amaze me every day. Um, you know, you put, a, you put some kind of a writing prompt together for them and I'm just blown away by it, right? And so when I'm in my space, it's always a really good thing. But the pressure of the possibility of what could be happening with people's lives and the impact that it could be having um, and the death that could result of it has been um, really stressful. And it made a big difference in the number of people who returned to teaching. Um, I think nationally that's true, but we lost a large percent of our teachers this year who decided not to come back into um, into their classrooms. And um, that has been difficult as well. We mentioned at the beginning about Nancy Atwell and how her work, you know, the writing workshop and reading workshop has influenced you. And how do you see that working in this current situation? Um, you know, what needs to change in order for that, the sort of work that you did before COVID to be possible now? Okay, so <laughs> I feel like every year I have this plan of what I'm going to do that improves upon what I did the year before, and I go into the classroom, and then it changes as the class unfolds, and each class changes differently. So even if I'm teaching two English classes, one might be best in this direction and another in another direction. So I can't say that I have any answers to anything, because as things are happening, I'm going to change them up so that they work better. But um, 
Yeah, it's hard because a lot of our writing is responding to each other, and that's just harder to do in a virtual space. Um, we have been using Padlet, and I give the kids prompts, and once a week they will take one of those pieces of writing and put it on there, and then we've been responding to each other that way, and that becomes a really nice space, um, a nurturing space, and I'm as much as possible trying to imitate what we do in our five-day rights, and um, I think Nancy Atwell changed me most because I had always been taught writing as an outcome and that outcome got graded and there wasn't a lot of process of the writing or just freedom to write what we wanted when I was in school and so it was very eye-opening when I read her book and go oh my gosh that's exactly what should be happening right and so I tried as much as possible to continue to flip into that kind of a mode and so um I'm still trying to do that. So kids will still get a prompt each day and they'll have time to write. And the school year is very early, early right now. And so um, we haven't gotten, and, and we, we were online and or we were in person and then we went online and then they're going back in in person. And um, it's been a little bit challenging to get any kind of routine going with them. And I felt, the, I feel so sorry for the kids because the ones who were face to face didn't think that at first didn't think that anything being posted to Google Classroom was for them because that was online work and they were face to face and they didn't have to look at the assignments on there. So there's just been this like, okay, this is what the routine looks like. So it's all about relationships and routine right now. And the rest of it is going to come later, but without being, you know, being outside of the classroom and not having kids in your space is very different. It just is very different. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you mentioned is writing about on to writing about what you need to. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, you know, April, May, June, July. Did you notice anything about you as a writer about where you were going or what going, like what topics you were writing about or what forms you wanted to write that felt that you needed to do or wanted to do? Um, so I think that having the space to write certainly was helpful in my doing something on a daily basis. I don't get to do that very often. Usually summer is my time to write and <laughs> summer feels like it didn't really happen this year. Like everything just kept continuing on and I continued to do a reading uh, book club and a writing summer book club for kids this summer. And that took me all the way right up to August. And, you know, it felt like I was in school mode all of that time. We just did a lot of meeting with each other. Um, and there were more kids that, that did that this year. And I think because they wanted an outreach and parents were happy to have um, some structure to their day and some, some, you know, guidance and writing and reading. Um, and so my writing, um, boy, I don't know. I don't know. I think the poetry during that April month um, and repeating a routine every day was really good. Um, I don't, I, I feel like I kind of fluctuated between very somber poems and things that were a little bit more uplifting. And I think that kind of depended on not only the prompt, but also what was happening in the news of that day, right? This is very much like 9-11. I can remember experiencing 9-11 in real time and watching it unfold on TV. And then afterwards, for whatever reason, I felt like I needed to have the news on every morning. And that lasted for a very long time until it was like, okay, I don't have to watch the news because it's probably going to be okay. And now with the COVID, I feel like I'm checking the numbers every day and that's still happening. And it's only been recently that I've been like, okay, I don't have to look at it five times a day. <laughs> I can only look at it once a day and it'll be okay. Um, and I think a lot of that was because I was trying to figure out where our state was in relation to what school was going to look like, right? Like if our numbers go up, that's going to change what happens at school. Um, I did find that it was hard. I didn't have trouble reading. A lot of people said that they had trouble reading during COVID. I was still able to read. I did feel like if a book didn't hold my attention, it was too complicated. My mind was in too many places and I set that one aside and picked up something that I could read more easily. Um, but as far as writing, I don't know that I wrote as much as I normally would write in the summertime because 
it, it still felt like we didn't really have a summer. And so my break didn't happen in the same way. We were doing a lot of PD to learn how to teach online in the summer. Our school asked us to do that. And so that was happening over eight weeks and, um, or yeah, six to eight weeks. And there was about eight hours a week that we were doing um, and learning new platforms and things that would connect with Google Classroom and how best to teach online. And so I don't feel like I ever really got out of school mode like I normally do. You mentioned a writing, a book club, and PD. Were all of that part of your teaching contract, or did you do that just extra? So I typically do a writing club in the summer because I have a lot of kids that want to write. And so that is just extra. That's outside of school time. And the book club happened because I was because kids were expressing that they wanted something to happen. And so both of those were outside of school time. They were just things that I, you know, essentially volunteered to do. Um, but the PD was not part of our contract. Um, we could, we could do it if we wanted to, but the indication to us was that we were probably going to be teaching online again. And it felt like we should be doing that so that we were <laughs> able to teach online in the event that we went back full-time online, but which didn't happen. So uh, there was a little bit of frustration with teachers that we had spent a lot of time learning all of this. And then it wasn't even, it wasn't even going to be an option. We didn't offer the online option to parents until a lot of parents are saying, wait a second, we're in the middle of a pandemic and we don't want our children face to face, or we can't have our children face to face because they might have health issues or somebody in the household has health issues. And so, um, you know, a number of kids ended up going online. I wonder if you can tell us any of the, like, for their summer book club that you were reading or the, or the writing club, can you tell us any of the titles or writers that you were looking at or any kind of the writing that you were asking your students to do? Sure. Um, so I had sent them a list of maybe... for their, their would be most interested in reading. Normally we would choose the same book and we would get into small group, you know, or I put small groups together with the same book, but I didn't want to take away any kind of an option for anybody. I wanted them to be able to read as much as they could and as many, you know, from whatever genre that they wanted to read from. And so we actually, in this, I don't know if I would do this again, but we actually ran the book club with everybody reading the books that they wanted to. And then we tried to talk about the similarities between them. So um, we read Fractured Tide, we read um, uh, Blackthorn Key, we read Black Brother, Black Brother. Um, those are the, we, we looked at um, the, what we started with while kids were deciding which books they wanted and we, they were ordering books. We started with the Ichabod by um, uh, J.K. Rowling and that was kind of interesting because there was there was some themes in there that were um, that could connect with what was going on in the world, right? So that was interesting. Um, and as far as the writing, boy, we looked at um, we listened to an NPR with Kwame Alexander, and we did some writing from the words that he had um, used during that um, during the d during the NPR. It was like a podcast. We used some of the writing prompts that were from the five day open verse. Um, trying to think specifically because it has been a while since I've done that. Um, we did some, um, oh, I know, we did the last, um, Kathleen Birkinshaw is the author of The Last Cherry Blossom, and she saw that I was doing this online, and she volunteered to um, come and, and speak with the kids and look at their writing, and so she showed up one day, and we did some haiku writing with her. Um, her story is remarkable. It's about, her mother actually experienced um, the bomb dropping in um, Hiroshima, and so the story is from her mother's perspective, and um, so she taught us a little bit about haiku and then gave responses to the kids on the Padlet, which was really, really incredible and generous. Amazing. So these are all things that you were um, creating and nurturing in these spaces for your students in the summer, right? In addition yes. to and during the PD to get ready for online. And so what, like what's next for you as an educator? Like you obviously didn't have this break to recharge or to have this writing time for yourself and and what do you think the next you know few months or even year is going to look like for you as an educator how are you going to um, keep it going 
Yeah, I don't know. There's so many teachers who are expressing that they're going to burn out. And I'm very concerned that this whole situation right now is going to be sustainable for teachers. Um, I think teachers are very good at putting on a good face in front of their students, no matter what's going on outside of that, and being in the classroom in a very authentic and present way for students. And they're going to continue to do that. Um, I'm just worried that outside of that time, you know, they're going to experience they're going to they're going to burn out essentially um i know that when i'm talking with other teachers they're all experiencing that same thing right now so i can remember being in an education class and the um, head of the education department was teaching the class and he had said that our current model of the education system would not change unless something catastrophic happened like a world war or something right and you know being 20 years old you're like oh, well that's not going to happen and you know you just don't think about it and then as you educate for longer you realize that there's a lot of things that really need to be changed about the education system and even though you're working to make changes in your classroom and to do the best you can in your classroom it's a systemic thing and so as soon as this happened i can remember talking to my administration my administrator and saying wow we have this opportunity to actually make changes. Like what is it that we wanna see happen in education so that going forward, there's actually change. Um, and of course, everybody was just doing this, you know, like responding to things. And I don't think there was ever really time to say what is the best, what is really good. Um, we need to do that because we were still reacting. And I feel like we're still reacting to things. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping we didn't miss the opportunity to make changes. Um, if this, if this, if this year doesn't break the education system, I don't know that those changes will get made, but if we all just, you know, if it just kind of, I feel like it's a house of cards in some way. And if it just kind of falls down, it's going to have to be rebuilt in a new way. That's, that's a better way for, for students. You mentioned a few things earlier about the students who were, you know, writing at working at night and sleeping during the day and some that preferred it online. Are those some of the changes that you're referring to, or do you have some other ideas about if the cards fall, how would you, how would you recommend we rebuild? Well, for sure. I think that kids need options. Um, we had, we had, I would say the majority of our students actually really did well with online learning. There were some kids who just didn't. That happens also within the classroom. Um, and when we thought it was a temporary situation, we were doing our best within that time period. But if we were to look going forward, I think that having that option for kids to be able to learn online if they prefer to or in a classroom, if that works best for them, is really essential. Um, there are, but, but it's also a skill to learn to be online, right? And to, and to educate yourself online. And so I don't think it's a bad experience for any student to um, learn to navigate a computer and platforms on a computer and those kinds of things. Um, obviously some kids are going to need a little more guidance than others. Um, I would like to see more of a, or less of a focus on grades within our system in general. I think that's too much of an outcome. Um, it doesn't become like, I would love to see kids have more intrinsic value in, in learning um, and, and their learning path. Um, and I, I would like more flexibility within the space too, um, so that kids could explore in ways that aren't entirely dependent on a curriculum that's driven either nationally or you know locally or whatever, um, so that they have some independent choices. Those those are the biggest things. I, and I would like I would definitely like more one-on-one uh, -on -one time with students. Right now, it's it's a lot of students in one space and you don't have a lot of time with each of those students. And I think that if you had fewer students, the ratio to teachers and students was smaller, um, the impact would be greater. So what I hear in your, um, is, is a lot of the sense of like recognizing the individual. And I recall you having a poem um, between two selves. I wonder if now would be a good time to share that. Sure. Okay. Between two selves. The first time I held my sons, oh, in March, 
E, five years later, the multitudes of the world, the cacophoning sounds, the echoing answers, reduced themselves to just the sanctuary of two, an entire world between us, every molecule and atom, every heartbeat, drum thrumming, every solitary thread of our existence held together between two selves. Well, we have been talking for almost an hour here, and I want to um, respect your time. Is there anything else you want to say about maybe your hope for, for teachers or for the future or um, be, before we close? Um, so, well, my hope is that everybody stays safe, um, obviously, with the pandemic, um, and that we can continue to build communities between anyone in education, um, but between teachers so that they can support one another, um, between writers, and allow teachers to have the time to explore their own writing and their own reading and or whatever their whatever their specialty is, um, so that they can live it as much as they can for their students and with their students, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I just, I just want to, to believe that there's going to be <laughs> this light at the end that's going to you know pull all of this pandemic to the side and that we're going to be in a really good space um and i know kids want that as well i mean when you when you listen to them they're they, they worry about it the writing that they wrote in the summer they were worried about things right um even in april when when they were doing their writing and in, in, in may um there was a lot of worry about what's happening with this but um giving them the time to write and being able to express those ideas on paper or on a typewriter or like a computer, I think is, is really important for them. Wonderful. Well, we are um, continue writing our way through, um, uh, through this and hopefully um, there will be a time when we will write our way out of it. And I wonder um, in closing, I think you might have one more poem, the Requiem Mass okay. and reading that to I thank you so much for your generosity of time and spirit. Thank you. Okay, um, Requiem Mass. <clears throat> In this cathedral of our world, we honor the dead. The relentless waves have stilled, a retreat on bended knee, a threnody. We no longer need their crashing beat. The winds come to final rest, harboring inside organ pipes, a lament. We hear no more their measured breath. The earth's hum has paused its ancient choir silenced, an elegy. Its voice sounds no more for us, the fires doused and extinguished, a dissipation of the dying, a funereal hymn. We heap all on its pyre, our voices chant, Dies Eri, echoes of the haunting, Dies Eri. Our voices expand, Dies Eri, our own dirge. Thank you, Jennifer. All right, thank you so much, it was good to see you.